morning, brethren. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to this Sabbath service. It's a beautiful morning. It's good to see the fine weather with us. Now, this morning, I wish to explain to you the true meaning of this festival, Pentecost. <coughs> it is a very important festival in God's plan of salvation for mankind. <coughs> Uh, 30 days ago or so we kept the Passover <coughs> which as we know uh, commemorated the death and sacrifice of our Saviour Jesus Christ <coughs> and then of course followed by the day of the unleavened bread uh, gives us the opportunity to check our lives <coughs> and to put sin out of our lives <coughs> And here we are on the Feast of Pentecost. <coughs> and, you know, really, Pentecost, if anything, is more important, or just as important, as the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You might say, now, hold a minute. What do you mean? I mean that Christ died for our sins, we admit that. And by grace we are saved through faith, not of ourselves, as anyone should boast. But if it hadn't been from God's Holy Spirit in us, <coughs> be null and void. Our sins would have been forgiven, and that's it. But you need God's Holy Spirit to enable us to become more like Christ <coughs> day by day <coughs> and qualify for his kingdom and his return to this earth. I say both are important. <coughs> But uh, one hinges upon the other. Because we didn't have the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, no point in having the Holy Spirit. Now, if you check Leviticus 23, uh, the, you will get there the sequence of the story for God's plan of salvation for mankind. We're <coughs> observing, of course, his holy days. Now, in the Old Testament, <coughs> God's Holy Spirit was not available to people in general, with the exception of a few people like David and others. Uh, if you turn to Psalm 51, <coughs> if you turn to Psalm 51, <coughs> we read here about David <coughs> pouring out his heart to God <coughs> because of what he had done, the sins he had committed. As you know, he uh, had he committed adultery with Bathsheba and had committed murder by getting his or now his or her husband to be killed, put him in the front of the <coughs> of the wall. And here in chapter fifty one or Psalm fifty one uh, we will read <coughs> Uh, verse 1 he cries out to God and says have mercy on me O God according to your unfailing love according to your great compassion blot out my transgressions wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin <coughs> and God of course that we know is compassionate loving God and it's good that he is or co very compassionate because otherwise uh, we would be in trouble. <coughs> so continuing here, for I know my transgressions, verse 3, and my sin is always before me. Against you only, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your eyes, so that you are proved right when you speak. And dropping down to verse 10, it says, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And we do cry out to God, as you know, for God to show us our faults, our sins, and to, <coughs> and, and to help us to follow in his ways. Do not cast me from your presence, and take your Holy Spirit from me. <coughs> now we know that, as I've already mentioned, that God's Holy Spirit is not available to all people, but 
uh, here of course God can make ex exceptions because he's God of the universe but uh, the uh, God of course didn't give his Holy Spirit until the day of Pentecost this feast that we are not keeping or observing today <coughs> and he continues here restore me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me so uh, the uh, as if, with the exception of a few people and of course the reason being God's son Jesus Christ had to come to this earth for God's Holy Spirit to be given and if we turn actually to Isaiah 9 turn to Isaiah 9 this is something that we hear quite a lot coming up to Christmas you know, the Messiah <coughs> and we have such great advantage today because in those days they had, they, they, they had only part of the Bible they had no New Testament but we have the combined lot today so there's no real excuse for us with the complete package in other words so here in Isaiah 9 and uh, verse 6 For to us a child is born to us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom establishing and upholding it with justice and, and righteousness from that time on forever the zeal of the Lord Almighty God will accomplish this and God has a plan of course you know, for, for mankind to bring peace to this world because as we know today that Satan is the God of this world and he is influenced all uh, areas of society <coughs> but uh, Satan will be <coughs> aside and kind of the opportunity to live God's ways <clears throat> for their shall be full of God's glory as the waters cover the sea <clears throat> God has a plan for mankind it's great to know that <clears throat> now in Matthew 1 <clears throat> we read about of course what was prophesied there in Isaiah 9 and if you go over to Matthew 1 <clears throat> We'll pick up the story here <coughs> in verse 18. <coughs> and the heading I have here, the birth of Jesus Christ. <coughs> this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to marry, to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with the child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home to you to be your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will say, and uh, you will save him. The, the name of, or you will name him Jesus, because he will save the people from their sins. <coughs> Reference, of course, <coughs> to his crucifixion later on. <coughs> now it's interesting here, brethren, <coughs> and this contradicts the Trinity. <coughs> And three persons in one God. <clears throat> now, Mary would be subject to the death penalty <clears throat> if she had, in other words, uh, had uh, committed adultery with the Holy Spirit, if it's a person. But the thing about it is, the Holy Spirit is not a person, it's the essence of God. How could it be? It's a possibility. You know, it's God's Spirit. 
and because God Spirit dwells in us, and not the Holy Ghost, not a person, God Spirit gives us the power to become like Christ. So I thought I would just clear that matter up there. Um, and the uh, <clears throat> an interesting thing also you read in Luke uh, chapter two and verse nineteen. <clears throat> <clears throat> that Mary pondered all these things and kept them in her heart. <clears throat> Just imagine her then, Emma. Here I'm pregnant. <clears throat> Joseph and I have not been together. <clears throat> yes, they were engaged to be married. So what's happening here? <clears throat> Put yourself in Mary's shoes. I think you'd be perplexed. Of course, God's was watching over it all. And God said, and the angel, God sent an angel to say, Don't be afraid, because all this has been planned by God, the only God of the universe. And uh, <coughs> as I say, she pondered those things in her heart. We also remember, brethren, in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4, it says, There's only one God. <coughs> There's only one God, but that is what you call the hypostasis, <coughs> which means the three attributes of God. <coughs> God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Anyway, let's go on here. Uh, let's turn to John 13. <coughs> His desire <coughs> to keep <coughs> the Passover. John 13. It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil was already prompted. Judas had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God, because, of course, he was God in the flesh. Emmanuel means <coughs> God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, and. Uh, <coughs> he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he, he, he washed, uh, I'm sorry, began to wash the, his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped ar around him. And he came to Simon Peter and said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize. Now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. Of course, no, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash your feet, you have no part with me. <coughs> and uh, and he uh, <coughs> goes on to say there that Christ said, I set you an example. He washed the disciples' feet. <coughs> now it's very interesting. <coughs> Uh, we read here <coughs> that uh, you know he said I have given you an example I will give you a command to wash one another's feet <coughs> bear this in mind <coughs> that when we are washing one another's feet Christ is also there washing our feet because his spirit lives in us Christ in us. So, so important it is. We might have actually glimpsed over it. But when you actually think about it and dwell on it, you can see the reality and the meaning of it. <coughs> so, and then, of course, we know the story that Christ was resurrected and uh, he then appeared to them. And they were all perplexed, as you understand. And actually, in John 14, verse 1 to the 8, <coughs> let's turn to, to John 14, verse 2, 1 to the 8. Do not let your hearts be troubled. <coughs> he appeared to them. <coughs> he was out in, in spirit. 
He said, trust in God, trust also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. Uh, that you may also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. I can't see anything there of anybody going to heaven. Now you can't see your places. There are rooms there. And <coughs> we know that we shall reign on the earth. <coughs> As if we qualify. We know, brethren, that uh, the, uh, no one has ascended into heaven. He said, only Christ who has ascended into heaven. Even David has not yet ascended into heaven. Yes, the Spirit goes back to God who gave it, which is another thing. It, it is kind of a record for the rest of God. But it's good to clear those matters up. But people are confused. And I wish they would actually interpret the Bible, and not interpret it, but read it the way it is. <coughs> but uh, anyhow, uh, he goes on to say here, Philip said, Lord, how show us the Father? And that would be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show me us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the, in the Father and the Father is in me? It doesn't say anything about the Holy Ghost. The words I say to you are not just my own, rather it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Because the many, of course, is God in the flesh. He said, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will, he will do even greater things than these because I am going to my Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. And uh, of course, Christ said that he would uh, uh, give him the Holy Spirit to be, uh, to be a patient. And then, uh, of course, the apostles, uh, Peter, of course, was the man that was up front of the disciples. And he said, it's all over type of thing. <coughs> we don't really understand. He was with us for three and a half years. <coughs> and uh, we followed him and gave up fishing on boats and everything. <coughs> And here we are, I'm sure the people are laughing at us. <coughs> and then, uh, of course, what did Peter say? Let's go fishing. Let's go back to what we were doing before this. <coughs> but uh, Christ said, no, be patient. And if you were, uh, uh, in, in Acts 1, you turn to Acts 1. The, in Acts 1, and we'll come into verse 1. Acts 1, verse 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up into heaven. And said, Christ is the only one who has actually uh, come back to heaven. Um, you had, of course, his father to sit at his right hand until the day he was taken up into heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. <clears throat> after this, after his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many conviction, convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them his command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my father, father promised, which you have heard, 
we speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days' time you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they, verse 6, so when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? <coughs> See again, <coughs> they felt inside that you know that he's coming back right away, and they're under Roman occupation, <coughs> and they thought this is it, we're going to be freed. <coughs> and I won't, I'm sure God, you know, and looks at us and shakes his head at times and says, will they ever learn? Oh, but we're a human being, God understands that. And he said, uh, I do not leave Jerusalem, wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard uh, me speak about. And then uh, verse 6, so when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes, it's the essence, on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And verse 9 after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid from their sight. And they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. When suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside him, for the angels, men of Galilee, they said, Why do you stand before uh, here looking into the sky? The same Jesus which you have seen him from me going to heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And if you go to Acts 2, brethren, I'm just continuing here. <coughs> In Acts 2 and ver verse 1, when the day of Pentecost, which we are observing today, came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now as William mentioned last week, this is nothing to do with speaking in tongues, <coughs> these are languages and it says on here. Note they were staying in Jerusalem, God fearing Jews from every nation under, and they understood each one in their own language. And again, it, it, William said that, I mean, this was a big event. It spread throughout all that area. It's a bit of a representative here. Something's going to happen. <coughs> what is going on? <coughs> and, uh, of course, they were able to understand one another. That was the first miracle. But it has nothing at all to do with speaking in tongues. That's gibberish. I mean, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians about chapter 12, I wanted to hear a few, uh, two sentences in words I can understand than a whole lot of things that make no sense with that effect. All right, people, some people believe that, if they don't believe that, it's up to them. But, uh, I mean, when you come to think of it, if I commence to speak in, in gibberish here, you see what he's, what's he up to? He's going off his head a little bit. <coughs> no? But anyway, be that as it may. Uh, but uh, in uh, uh, verse 42, <coughs> It's a dropping down to verse 42. Then uh, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and, and miracles. Uh, and many wonders and miracle signs were done by the apostles. And all the believers together had had, had uh, everything in common 
selling their positions, etc., etc. About 120 people at it in there. Now, this thing here, which again I have to clarify, is not to do with the communion service. Uh, it was in, on, in those days, uh, people went from house to house. <coughs> and, and they'd been to the temple and sit there, and they went to one people's houses. And, uh, and they had a meal. And they shared it. Yes, you could say, this communion of people. But it's not to do with the communion as we know it today. <coughs> but uh, the uh, they help one another. <coughs> now, uh, later on, actually, uh, actually in Acts 4 and verse 4, there were 5,000 added. <coughs> uh, let's turn to it because it, there's an interesting little thing here that I want to bring out. <coughs> um, and it's interesting also that we only read, we don't read any more about the 120. Thousand or the five thousand. <coughs> Obviously, they were there. We read about the apostles. <coughs> but any idea that this is made, <coughs> uh, as it was in the days of Joshua, was that he said he thought he was the only Elijah, rather. Uh, he thought he was the only one. And Christ said, I have reserved five thousand that have not bowed their heads to, to Baal. <coughs> but uh, in uh, Verse 4 of chapter 4, it says here that, but many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. <coughs> believed. But we must remember. <coughs> In John 6 and verse 44, it says, No man can come to the, the Father, or can come to me except the Father draws him. That's the start. But <clears throat> then you have to believe and grow in the grace and knowledge of, of Christ. You can reject it. The Bible says, Do not quench the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so there's a sequence of events here. <clears throat> You know, you take for instance today, <coughs> the large Pentecostal movements and so forth, uh, <coughs> there's no doubt about it <coughs> that Christ's name and God the Father has been spread abroad, <coughs> and many of them do believe to the best of their advantage. But has God called them? It's a start. No, I am just, I, I could be wrong, <coughs> but uh, thinking the whole thing through. <coughs> Because God has to call you first. You're a privileged person. And to those who is much given is much expected. <coughs> God does not throw up willy-nilly. He said, are you going to just turn your back on me? <coughs> and so those actually who have once been enlightened and turning their back and not fit for the kingdom of God. <coughs> those are not my words. That's the Bible. <coughs> but I say it, 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 that, that's interesting. Now, throughout the book of Acts, <coughs> and of course it says, those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And we all have suffered problems and everything. We must remember God is trying us and testing us. <coughs> and it says in Philippians 4, <coughs> verses uh, 5 to about 7. As I mentioned before, you present the problem to God, not thank God for the problem, but thank that God is there to, <coughs> to, 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 to take it on board. Because we are his people. And he loves us. He cares for us. And he says, bring it to me. And there the apostles, look what they went through. Particularly, for example, Peter and John <coughs> thrown into prison. <coughs> God sent an angel to free them, and they did great miracles. There was, for instance, uh, Stephen put to death. And it's an interesting thing that, that all the apostles, and perhaps all of them, were beheaded. Why did God allow that? Why did he not allow them to die naturally? We don't know. But they were faithful to God, right to the very end. And then, uh, 
it says in 2 Timothy 3 verse 12 uh, 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 those who uh, live godly in Christ Jesus and suffer persecution <coughs> uh, so we have to become more like Christ <coughs> day by day <coughs> and God's spirit is now in us <coughs> and God expects results <coughs> and there are various parts of the Bible that gives us kind of indications of what we should be like but if we turn to Galatians 5 <coughs> turn over to Galatians 5 we will read here <coughs> the fruits of the spirit Uh, in verse 21 uh, well verse 19 the acts of the sinful nature are obvious sexual immorality, impurity debauchery, idolatry witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy fits of rage selfish ambition, dissensions factions and envy drunkenness, orgies and the like, I warn you as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. <laughs> and it's a warning <coughs> to people. That's of course Satan dwelling in the world. <coughs> and as we know that he said to Christ, in the pinnacle of the temple, fall down and worship me, and then give you the whole kingdoms of the world. <coughs> And of course, Christ said to get you behind me, Satan. Uh, you live by what I say, <coughs> not any other way. <coughs> now, but the fruit of the Spirit, you know, in this way the world is today. And many other scriptures that actually describe that. But it said the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have, cru uh, have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoked, uh, and envying each other. <coughs> and, and those are the things, brethren, <coughs> that we need to be thinking about and of course Matthew chapter 5 verse 1 to 11 it mentions there about Christ's love and, and, and uh, the examples that we should be following uh, but many other places and now I'd like to read to you brother <coughs> and I'm coming to the end of my sermon <coughs> and uh, the, uh, I'd like to read to you this year Paul wrote, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who be in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God, something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Mm. And they mentioned the book of washing and so forth and there and that when we are washing one another's feet we also Christ is there with us mm. now taking the nature of a servant in order to serve God you must focus on others rather than yourself much of what we do is self-serving we serve to be admired or to achieve our own goals is that quite true is that some of what we do is more manipulation than ministry. We're really thinking about ourselves and how noble and how wonderful we are. We even use serving as a bargaining tool. God, I'll do this for you if you will do that for me. Good for all basis. No true servants don't use God for their purposes. They let God use them for His. 
God is always more interested in your attitude, my attitude, than your achievements. He mentions here King and Messiah, that's God's favour, because he did what was right in the sight of, the, of God. What? Wait for it. Uh, yet not with a true heart. He did it for selfish gain. Self-forgetfulness is a daily struggle. A lesson we must learn over and over. You can measure your servant's heart by how you respond when those treat you like a servant. <coughs> how do you react when you feel taken for granted, bossed around, or treated as an inferior? Jesus said, if someone takes unfair advantage of you, use the occasion to practice a servant's life. And I, I've already mentioned Matthew 5, but in, uh, that's quoted from verse 41. You see, it's not fair. I keep giving to this person, but they never ever give back. Just keep serving, knowing the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he or she does. That's Ephesians 6 verse 8. And that's what we should be doing. Yes, we observe Pentecost, brethren, and that's wonderful, <coughs> a great blessing. <coughs> but the thing is, uh, do we just take it for granted? <coughs> If we can observe it and so forth, but do we practice it? That's the important thing. <clears throat> yes, brethren, Christ died for our sins, and we're very thankful to God for that. Uh, followed by Pentecost, they gave him his Holy Spirit, as if Christ living in us, enabling us to be more like Christ day by day. Yes, <clears throat> God is our Father, brethren, Jesus Christ, our elder brother, and we're family. What a privilege. What a blessing. Take care.